So today I want to give a talk based on um, some of my research as well as my experience in working public policy in D.C. and Europe on how internet activism changes policy. Uh, <clears throat> now, first off, on September 10th this year, 40,000 websites participated in an internet slowdown campaign to draw attention to the network neutrality debates in the United States. This debate centered on how the Federal Communications Commission will apply regulatory authority to protect an open internet. And is the latest internet policy issue which online collective action has targeted internet policy concerns. Some other examples include a previous internet protest on January 18, 2012, when the 115,000 websites voluntarily shut down in order to target the Online Piracy Act and the Protect IP Act, two copyright enforcement bills. Additionally, in 2012, in the following months after SOPA PIPA blackouts, there was online organizing that led to large scale street protests against the anti counterfeiting trade agreement in Europe. However, focusing only on the easily visible online advocacy misses the critical contributions of institutional advocacy in achieving democratic change. This talk moves between an online-only assumption of political action and demonstrates how institutional advocacy such as gaining access to government bodies, lobbying, and targeting decision makers provides a critical component for public advocacy examples such as mobilization and online advocacy. So building from these three case studies of the SOPA paper blackout, the act of protest, and the net neutrality debates, this talk offers a more nuanced understanding about how the internet and activism drives change. So let's first talk about the internet and advocacy. Numerous scholars, particularly in recent years, have discussed different virtues and drawbacks of digitally mediated engagement. For example, in her book, Stefani Milan, offers that internet is no longer just a tool for activist networking and mobilization, but it's become the main platform for action, recruitment, and identification. The internet has now become a driving force of how we see uh, the engagement in collective action. However, with regards to individual action, scholars differ with regards to efficacy. Bimber and Flanagan, for example, describe the rules of entrepreneurial actions in which individuals at the edge of networks have the autonomy to independently and through their own motivation explain, expand that network. This builds on what Keck and Sikik describe as the growth of advocacy networks depending on part of activists or political entrepreneurs. Some scholars have built on this to describe how the internet reduces the free rider dilemma of collective action. Lance Bennett and Alexander Segerby the, to say that the freeloader dilemma requiring central organization for the logic of collective action is mitigated through the lower cost of individual action and supports the logic of connective action. By contrast, Evgeny Morozov employs the term slacktivism to critique online engagement as a low-cost activity, which therefore detracts from meaningful activism. Zuckerman has offered some nuance to this debate. He describes participatory civics, in which there's thin participatory civics which engage profile, changing of profile photos or individual actions that don't take much thought versus more entrepreneurial actions in which activists are actively engaging, think about how do they contribute in a larger way. However, that doesn't exactly give us more insight into how activism drives change. One way to think about this is in terms of the position of actors. One approach is distinguishing between types of actors. Milan borrows from Sidney Taro by describing actors based on their position. We have inside actors, those participating in the policymaking process, while outside actors are kind of a confrontational relationship. This comes up often in policy debates where people talk about things in terms of perhaps inside-outside baseball. An, in an internet protest is a protest and a tactic of outsiders. But the recent debates I'll talk about demonstrate that internet users are also actively engaging with the policymaking process, a phenomenon of linking of outsiders inside as well as insiders playing outside that Taro has recognized in more recent work. I propose a different approach to how we analyze this, by looking at types of actions rather than the placement of actors. Sabine Lang offers a framework talking about types of advocacy in terms of public and institutional advocacy where public advocacy includes organizing protests, mobilizing citizens, whereas institutional advocacy is gaining access to government bodies, developing expertise on the policy process, and trying to influence decision makers. Identifying types of advocacy is important for multiple reasons. First, 
and it allows an investigating the possibility of institutional advocacy encourages the researcher to look beyond highly visible events such as hashtags and protests. Second, understanding the roles of different types of actors and the links behind what we would other describe as inside out type actors allows us to understand bridging dynamics and how, different, how actors can play multiple roles within driving change. Third, understanding the role of institutional decision making creates a foundation for investing in the process of decision making and the democratic legitimacy of institutions. So let's look at three case studies. To start, let's look at SOPA debates, which really peaked in 2012, but we'll talk about as a history. How many people here have heard of SOPA and PIPA? Quite a few. So perhaps you heard of it because you couldn't access Wikipedia for a day. Perhaps you went to Google and you were surprised to see this header. Or maybe you watched the Colbert Report or The Daily Show, and you were exposed to the debate. The events that really drove the news coverage of SOAP and PIPA happened on December, January 18th when over 115 websites participated in a voluntary blackout to stop the Stop Online Piracy Acts. Concerns over the bills included a provision in SOAP that created a blacklist of websites by tampering with the domain name system, which both raised concerns for freedom of expression, the risk of collective reprisal, as well as cybersecurity concerns. And the concerns were a peak of activity that was a blackout. The participating websites include Wikipedia, Reddit, Tumblr, and Google even censored their doodle on their .com homepage, which was the first overt political act Google had done on their page. However, organizing for collective advocacy efforts spanned months and for some groups even years before this event. Previously in 2010, COICA, the Combating Online Infringement and Counterfeits Act, was introduced. And the bill didn't make it to the Senate floor, but it did introduce some provisions that would later show up in SOPA. Demand Progress, watching this bill in 2012, started launching a campaign to raise awareness and develop public advocacy aware, uh, opposition to the campaign. In October of 2011, Fight for the Future launched a free Bieber campaign to draw attention to the Commercial Felony Streaming Act, which would increase penalties for streaming copyrighted materials, again a provision that was debated and returned in SOPA. So by the time SOPA was released in October 26, 2011, and the big push began, there was ready groups organizing, meeting, and networking amongst themselves and how to develop advocacy campaigns. So in a study of Berkman Center at Harvard, my colleagues of the news analysis found, here's SOPA, that while the months preceding the release of SOPA, there might not have been a lot of news, but it gave the opportunity for a small group of actors to develop power amongst themselves <laughs> and how to engage with the debate. So by the time SOPA came out and the protests happened, these small network groups are able to amplify each other within the network public sphere and raise news. So in the months preceding the protests, groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Public Knowledge, and Fight for the Future were amplifying concerns of the legislation in the network public sphere, and civil society were conducting and planning or, uh, outreach for an online protest, which was the blackout. And this timeline demonstrates the importance of the online protest. And the blackout, however, is not just the peak of advocacy efforts, but demonstrates the peak of another additional unseen and under the radar efforts. For example, EFF had organized a letter to members of Congress citing the cybersecurity concerns of SOPAs, which inspired the meme Bring in the Nerds, which Representative Jason Chavitz questioned in a December 7, 15th judiciary hearing, which then became a meme of where are the nerds, bring in the nerds, we're not technical experts, we need to be consulting at different advisors, which became an institutional wedge issue. Additionally, Google and other tech companies started ramping up their lobbying. Up until 2012, Google, or up until 2010, Google had budget about $5 million a year for lobbying. But they spent $5 million again lobbying in just the last quarter of 2012 and matched that same amount in the first or last quarter of 2011 and matched that amount for the first quarter of 2012, a major lobbying spike as they started investing considerable resources in the DC debate. The Wikimedia Foundation also registered a lobby for the first time to engage on the Hill in this debate. There were also new participants in intellectual property debates, such as human rights organizations, which organized a letter to the Congress comprising, raising their concerns of freedom of expression as well as internet freedom worldwide as a result of uh, SOPA within the US. And also started holding events on the Hill to discuss the ramifications of internet freedom. The groups organized in the blackout, like Fight for Future and Demand Progress, in addition to human rights organizations, were meeting with White House staff to dis discuss their concerns and personally deliver petitions. So the blackout raised more than public awareness, but it also encouraged US uh, internet users to engage with their representatives, what we might see as inside actors acting inside. Fight for the Future reports that 8 million calls were attempted using these tools on the day of the blackout. 
And I can tell you from my personal experience that I was on the Hill on, during the blackout meeting with a cadre of human rights organizations with Senate staff to discuss the concerns, and the phones were ringing off the hook. Senate staff were repeatedly were telling me that they were inundated with opposition to the bills. So what does this tell us? Public advocacy were, efforts were important because they generated news coverage and they raised the public profile of the debates. However, institutional advocacy also played a role. Traditional lobbying efforts such as by tech companies as well as the organizers of the protests and non-traditional organizations in IPT debates, the human rights organizations, were regularly pressing members of Congress and their staff to raise their concerns and push opposition. And these are bridging efforts as well, where the online campaigns were engaging internet users not just to change their profiles, not just to raise awareness and discuss the debate, but actively engage with institutions. They were asking online users to call their congressperson and engage with the institution. Let's move on to our second example, um, ACTA. This is a focus in the European debate. This followed directly after the SOPA debate. Now, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement was an agreement negotiated by a grand total of 30 countries. And it was also interesting within European democracy because it marked the first time the European Parliament actually had a voice on trade agreements. And interestingly, the public cared. There were protests, citizens calling members, and organized petitions leading to political shifts, and parliamentary committees became rejecting the agreement. But while the street protests that happened in 2012 were highly visible outputs of contentious politics, the defeat of ACTA is again the result of both public and less visible institutional advocacy efforts. So the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement was a framework that would create a new governing body outside of the World Trade Organization and the World Intellectual Property Organization to decide and mediate intellectual property concerns worldwide. It was negotiated from June 2008 to 2012 and was actually signed by 22 member states of the European Union as well as European Parliament on the 26th of uh, January in 2012. This did not mean that it was officially passed because the Parliament still needed to ratify it. And it gave a dem opportunity and democratic leverage for activists in Europe to put pressure on a democratic body to have their concerns heard. Some of the concerns that members of European civil society had was the three strikes provision in which a user's internet access would be severed if they were confused of copyright infringement three times. This had previously been debated in the European Parliament, been rejected, so to have this show up in an outside trade agreement brought up concerns of policy laundering or attempts to sidestep the democratic process. There was also concerns over the non-transparent negotiation process. Civil society members were not participants to the process. They did not have access to draft documents. In fact, they depended on leaks through WikiLeaks and the French digital rights groups, Le Quadre du Dunet which got access to documents from sympathetic governments in order to track progress and develop policy expertise. So when we look at the, the public advocacy, public advocacy played a considerable role. When the protests were a peak of public advocacy efforts, they were actually the result of five years of organizing among civil society groups. EFF started engaging with concerns of a new trade agreement in 2008. Their concerns were shared with La Quadra du Net, a Paris-based group, European Digital Rights, a Brussels-based lobbying organization for digital rights, I just started sharing analysis and sharing concerns over the debate. Leaked documents allowed them to produce um, detailed concerns, published documents, which then got shared with uh, the Panopticon Foundation in Poland and Digital Gesellschaft, a digital rights group in Berlin, Germany. With La Corte de Dunet even took the step to develop a public-facing wiki to share their concerns and have a public document around what are the actual details of ACTA and break down the, the policy analysis. Now, the start of the protests were an interesting case. In late 2011, the groups I previously mentioned were all meeting in, uh, at a hacker conference in Berlin discussing what the outcome would be in 2011 for ACTA. The prognosis was ACTA was a, a done deal. There wasn't enough political power to stop it. However, the, um, two important, interesting events happened that changed the minds and started releasing a new type of, uh, inspiring a new type of advocacy. The first happened with the SOPA blackouts. The SOPA blackouts were described by multiple activists I spoke to in Europe as a blueprint, as an example of what advocacy can do and an opportunity to beat legislation. The second example happened in Poland. The European debates were interesting because the debates were happening both on a national scale as countries were signing ACTA, as well as the European Parliament. And Poland was a key place of a national type debate. Civil society organizations in Poland were meeting with their members and meeting with their uh, government of officials in Poland to discuss the concerns of ACTA. And through the institutional advocacy efforts, Polish officials had promised they would not sign ACTA as civil society members still had concerns. 
So while on January 18th, the SOFA blackout happened and, and raised the possibility of protests stopping intellectual privacy, uh, intellectual copyright legislation, on January 19th, and due to time zones, while the blackout was still happening, civil society members were meeting with Polish ministers discussing their considering concerns at ACTA and urging them not to sign the document later that month. However, Polish ministers backed out of this agreement and said they were going to move forward and sign the, the, sign the agreement over civil society concerns. Civil society in Poland raised this through blog posts and public statements that they were concerned of, Polish's, of the Polish minister's decision. And then surprisingly, this led to spontaneous protests. Citizens started taking to the streets, unorganized at first and later through organized efforts, to have their opposition active be known. And peaked on January 25th when an estimated 10 to 15,000 activists took to the streets in Krakow, and additionally 5,000 in Warsaw. This would still continue to be a very Polish censored debate. The effort was to have it not be politically motivated, not to be related to any particular political uh, movement but simply be an act of internet users opposing to ACTA. However, the Polakov movement, a group of op an oppositional party, took the protest to Parliament, trying to take ownership of this and signing themselves as a favorable internet party. They donned Guy Fox masks, which had been popularized by Anonymous, to, ra to protest um, on January 26th the decision of the Polish government to vote. This move upset Polish organizers because they felt there was an attempt by a political party to take ownership or undo credit for the protests. But what it did do was also bring news coverage, inspire other countries to start protesting. So over the next two weeks, organizers realized they had an opportunity to start organizing a protest. They decided February 11th would be a good date, arbitrarily set as a date reasonably in the future that could be organized as a date for public protest. This became the first of two public protests. This is a map that was organized by one activist, citing 131 different cities in which simultaneous protests took place in ACTA on February 11th. Other news sites put this amount at um, 200. A later protest was also organized for June 9th, a date again picked relatively arbitrary by organizers with the intention of having another public display of opposition around the date when organizers would be, um, when organizers thought the event would take place in Europe. This event was smaller by a considerable amount, but it still also showed a relatively widespread opposition to ACTA within Europe. However, at the same time the public protests were act happening, organizers were also starting to engage with, uh, with the European Parliament and starting to push for institutional advocacy efforts. La Cour de, um, and their civil society actively was organizing how do they bridge this public opposition to raise awareness within, within European Parliament. One way this happened was European, was La Corte de Dunet launched PyPhone. It was a tool that allowed members of the public to call their members of European Parliament. This actually surprised members because this was not something that normally took place. European parliamentary members are not used to being responsible to their constituents and it allowed them to be aware that there was public, public opposition and for some of them, even be aware that the ACTA debate was taking place. ACTA was being negotiated by the Trade Committee, and most of the members of the European Parliament were not aware of it. But groups in Europe also took this another step further. La Croix du Dunet and, Edu digital and European Digital Rights not only were meeting with members of the European Parliament, but they started organizing hearings. They started making sure they were present during committees and um, question periods or consultations of, of ACTA, as well as organizing trips for volunteers to be coming inside the European Parliament, come to Brussels, and be present. As a result, MEPs who months prior were not even aware of ACTA started voting to reject the agreement. And on July 4th, spanning the six month visible movement, building on five years of less visible organizing, the full Parliament rejected ACTA by a vote of 478 votes to 39 with 168 <laughs> abstaining. So ACTA, a trade agreement which at one point seemed enviable, was effectively defeated in Europe by networked activists and efforts by the opposition. The third example I want to talk about is net neutrality. And as of this writing, net neutrality is a continuing case. It's a continuing debate in DC. Your FCC has yet to make a latest ruling on how do they want to move forward in net neutrality. And we've also seen recent advocacy efforts this year, such as the slowdown I talked about on September 10th. However, this is a long time debate. The debate's defined by a term coined by Tim Wu in 2003 
and has been defined by a decade of wonky DC debates. For example, in 2005, the FCC released an open, a, internet principles for an open internet where they wanted users to be able to connect to the websites of their choice and use the applications and services of their choice. But these were not enforceable rules. It was merely a policy provision. So in 2005, when engineer Rob Tobolsky noticed he wasn't able to upload barbershop quartets, public domain songs for the 1920s, over BitTorrent, he discovered Comcast was actually actively blocking his connection. It was a story that received national attention when he was in the hospital recovering from life-saving surgery when the AP replicated his tests and found they were unable to share the Bible using BitTorrent connections. So DC-based groups activated the institutional expertise in how to engage on this issue. Public knowledge and free press urged the FCC to start an investigation. However, the courts found that the FCC didn't have authority to regulate broadband. So the FCC attempts to institute a rulemaking proceeding under Title I. <coughs> so Title I authority is the ancillary authority of the, Federal, of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 in which or information services in which the FCC does not have clear defined authority is still might be the option for the FCC to choose to have authority over this. But as we saw with these debates, it was tenuous in courts. The FCC released rules in 2011, which Verizon immediately took to court and won. The courts ruled, the DC Court of Appeals ruled that the FCC under Title I authority doesn't have the authority to regulate the internet, to regulate communications and regulate ISPs to maintain open channels. This meant that the DC debate was based on this question of how does the FCC regulate authority and would they move to reclassify broadband as Title II authority undoing a 2003 regulatory, uh, a deregulation step by the FCC. So by the time we see the debate gaining visibility in 2012, we've already had a decade of very wonky institutional battles. But we have seen a, a surge of public awareness of, uh, of net neutrality this year, in part thanks to John Oliver on his June 1 segment, we discuss his net neutrality, and he also urges me members of the public to comment to the FCC, which crashed the website at the following site. On September 10th, Fight for the Future and Demand Progress, two of the groups that helped organize the SOPA blackout organized the internet slowdown, which included free Mozilla, Free Press, Reddit, Netflix, among others. And they were urging actors throughout this campaign to engage with the FCC, file comments, as well as to other types of activity. This would be an example of thin participatory politics if we, if we follow Zuckerman, in which social media actors change their social media avatar. But actors were also engaging in what could be thick political uh, participatory civics, but I would call more institutional advocacy when they're engaging with FCC writing comments. Um, they also encouraged, Fight for the Future also encouraged the public to call the FCC, the White House, and um, Congress to uh, share their support of, of, net, of net neutrality. Fight for the Future says that at peak during the slowdown, a thousand calls a minute were taking place as users were using online tools activated by online protests. And while John Oliver's segment caused a spike in comments, which you can see in June, the peak comments happened July 14th, right before the July 16th, to July 16th deadline. So John Oliver did have an impact, but other types of organizing had a larger, in fact, nearly an order of magnitude greater impact on activating online users to individually engage in institutional advocacy. Overall, the FCC has recorded a record number of comments. Previously, the record was about one and a half million. People were concerned and offended by a fleeting nipple during a Super Bowl. But for the net neutrality, the FCC, by their count, has received three million comments regarding net neutrality. One activist I spoke to puts this count above four million based on PDFs or comments included in a single PDF only being counted once. Of all these comments, a significant sample demonstrated that less than 1% completely opposed net neutrality. Now what the FCC does next is a, a continuing question that the FCC has waffled on in the past. Will the FCC move to reclassify broadband as a Title II <coughs> service, as asserting clear authority over broadband and ability to enforce net neutrality rules, or will they continue to attempt to move Title I rules or other types of authority which courts have pushed down in the past? This debate is yet to be seen, but in the meantime, campaigns are continuing urging activists to engage with the institutions. Demand progress is, 
urging their members to call Congress and the FCC on a daily basis to continue making their voices heard. It'll be interesting to see how the FCC debate plays out, but as we can see with net neutrality, as these other examples, public advocacy are very visible efforts we can see online, but the debate's also driven by more unseen institutional advocacy efforts. So what's this mean for researchers? Without question, the internet is a powerful tool for organizing communication. But as these examples demonstrate, democratic change for internet policy results of a combination of both public and institutional advocacy. And understanding individual activism requires understanding the relationship between the online and offline actions. So for example, if we were to look at Hong Kong, photos and Instagram probably is not enough to actually understand the debates. It gives us a fleeting moment in time when people are activated in the streets, but to understand the history, we should probably investigate and problematize the institution of democratic rule. This week in Hungary, 100,000 people have taken to the streets to protest the proposal for an internet tax, a tax on the transmission of data. Now this is a compelling image and a rising example of internet activism, but as researchers, we should also investigate the links to the media crackdown that Phil Howard discussed and understanding the structure of the national internet system within Hungary to understand how individuals are engaged in engaging and debating the process. SOPA was more than a blackout. SOPA was a coordinated lobbying and public activism advocacy campaign, including not just inside-outside actors, but actors playing different roles in bridging between public advocacy and institutional efforts. ACTA leveraged the rising opposition to street protests to build on half a decade of networks built between civil society organizations to leverage that public opposition directly to the European Parliament through organizing, lobbying, and presence. Net neutrality has become a publicly visible debate building on a decade of institutional advocacy by groups not just based in DC, but also grassroots media reform movements engaging and trying to preserve an open internet. So looking beyond the visible layers and investigating how actors engage with institutions provides a window into the process of decision making and better understanding how internet activism drives change. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Uh, I thought this was really great things. Um, a, a few questions about uh, uh, the relationship between activism, mobilization, and outcome, policy outcome. Mm -hmm. I thought, uh, I like really your, your, your point about the importance of institution. Um, factors, not just online activism and mobilization. Uh, but you see that in Hong Kong, um, you know, there are large crowds on, uh, in the street, and it's been happening for a long time, and we still don't see policy outcomes. So the, the problem is not just about online or offline. It's also, I, I, I wonder whether you want to say something about uh, the nature of the target of the political authorities, the nature of the authorities. Um, so that's one question. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, now, and then, uh, since I'm talking about China, China has also its cases about activism policy change, which is you know, active, uh, positive policy outcome. 2009, there's a case called Green Dam software. And China's in, you know, Ministry of Information Technology announced that it was going to require all computers sold in China to, be, to have a pre-installed software called Green Dam, supposedly to protect uh, children, you know, juniors, from, from internet harms. And then there was protest, uh, but there was no street protest, online protest. But it, it produced positive policy outcome. And one of the powerful players uh, during that the period was um, also not quite visible. So this is the point about invisible institutional players. And those were international, transnational corporations, major firms. So the other question is the role of transnational actors in these kind of processes. Both very good questions. I think with the return to Hong Kong, the, the point I raised earlier on, why we should be investigating, one of the points I raised in, <coughs> raised in why we should investigate in institutional advocacy, because it allows us to problematize institutions themselves. So looking at Hong Kong, it's interesting to look at 
people taking to the streets and understanding why is that taking place from a collective action theory point, but doesn't actually understand this, why is change happening or not happening. So understanding the, the history of democratic institutions and the tensions of contentious politics and the institutions as a target of contentious action, I think would allow us to question what's the legitimacy of decision making and what opportunities are there for publics to engage with that process or not. Who are the actors that are actually able to and historically able to um, move, act, move <laughs> debates. When I looked at ACTA, what was interesting was people took to the streets, but members of the European Parliament said that they, most, they didn't feel like it was actually still an issue that was being debated. News coverage was generated by street protests, but that was in a way in a bubble compared to the type of news members of the European Parliament were taking. So it took a step in which activists were going to Parliament and raising the public concern to help actors within European Parliament be made aware of it. I don't think that with the street protests in Hong Kong, that type of divide is taking place. I think that I would suspect it's very clear that these protests are happening and there's opposition. But I would act, want to investigate the questions of why isn't change happening and what is the process through which democratic change or moves towards more democratic institutions take place. In China, uh, can you repeat your question? Well, the question is, this kind of yeah. process is of activism, mobilization, policy change, especially in the, you know, in the contemporary world. Uh, how do we conceptualize the role of transnational actors, especially transnational corporations? Right. Um, Kek and Sikik have an idea called the boomerang effect, in which <laughs> activists feeling within one country they don't have the potential to make a vertical change with their government, move to outside actors to, legit, to help legitimize the idea where a government of a, foreign, of a foreign country would then put horizontal pressure on a state to move change. I think one role of transnational actors, if we look at that a binary relationship, would be the role of transnational actors continuing the idea of a boomerang effect, but acting independent of a government or in concertion with the government to do similar legitimizing efforts for on-the-ground actors or be pushing um, their own interests. I think one interesting thing that's happened with, with China is this idea of uh, what some scholars have called collateral freedom, in which while some internet tools are blocked, those or internet um, circumvention tools, those built in Google services have a more likelihood of being made available because there's economic costs to banning Google services writ large. Google, banning Google's API would have economic costs that are wider than the political risks. So that there's a business interest shared between Google and the Chinese government to make certain tools available. And I think that's another example of where business interests um, can legitimize democratic concerns or um, the, the concerns of protesters. Well, I think we saw that in SOPA as well, in which the business community raising the concerns of the uh, cybersecurity over DNS. So DNS is a domain name service in which when you type in a domain name, such as google.com, your ISP will resolve that to the IP address that actually stands for google.com and is the, is the address online. The problem with this is that it's a great new service worldwide, but it has a fatal flaw, that, which means a man in the middle of attacks can happen, and someone created a fake Google.com, and you don't actually know that. So there's a security proposal called DNSSEC, which most uh, ISPs and countries have adopted, um, but it doesn't allow false resolution of domain. So the Chinese government is one country that has not adopted DNSSEC. If the United States had moved forward with DNS blacklisting, as a country, we would not be able to use the cybersecurity standard which is becoming a worldwide standard. So the business community was able to raise, this is a significant risk, and use that as a wedge issue um, for stopping the DNS blacklisting idea in SOPA. And I would be wondering if there's similar cases that's being made in China. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, when you were talking about the institutions and the role of internet <coughs> activism, it reminds me, I don't know whether we can make this connection, in mid-90s when MacAuto, McCarty, and Zell put that volume, comparative perspective towards social movements, they try to go beyond that just resource mobilization can define social activism. You need also political opportunities to make a movement successful. So probably institutions provide this political opportunity, access to the power structure to implement those ideas, but you need the backup of all this resources that you mobilize, bring to the streets to provide enough pressure you need. In the case of Hong Kong, it's blocked. You, you cannot easily get the access to the political structure 
to negotiate that or they're trying to open it up. Do you think that does it make sense? I think the idea of political opportunity is a very interesting point. If we look at SOPA, so we had COICA, which was released in 2010, PIPA that was released um, shortly thereafter in the Senate, which stalled, uh, and then SOPA that was released in the House in late 2011. There wasn't a major political pushback against these until SOPA was released. And the question would be, did, that, did SOPA create a unique political opportunity? And I would actually say yes, and that might be interesting to include the analysis. The DNS blacklisting provision was included in the COICA and was the reason that that bill failed. PIPA was a renegotiated agreement that did not include this and in some ways was considerably less harmful than SOPA. However, a later bill came up that included, again, the DNS provision. My analysis would be that this was a misstep by Hollywood in which they thought they could, over, they could take more of a copyright maximalism approach and use that as an effort to have pressure and force companies on the other side and actors on the other side of debate to renegotiate and compromise back to the Press Act IP Act. That was a political misstep that gave the, the impetus to say, to cry foul and, gave that, um, and create that political opportunity. The political opportunity that took place in ACTA was this idea that there was the SOPA blackouts and we could organize and stop a legislation, which inspired actors to see what they could do in Europe. So I think that analyzing what were the political opportunities that, that arose um, is, a, is a good point to include. Um, <coughs> there was a, uh, an article that was published over the summer by Ben Page, and I can't remember his co-author, uh, where they, um, and I can't, I, I read the article, I can't remember the name of the journal, the title of the article, but I can send it. <laughs> I, can, I can send it. Uh, it has okay. oligarchy in the title, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's a really interesting claim that they make based on studying policy outcomes. And uh, what they look at is the comparing uh, elite influence versus populist influence. And uh, the argument that, or the, the conclusion they draw is that there's um, minimal to no correlation between populist opinion and, um, out, and advocacy and policy outcome. And there's very high uh, correlation between elite uh, advocacy and policy outcome. And so if you, uh, I was wondering if, if what you've looked at would, uh, would support that, uh, particularly in the way of, um, and some people would, would argue that, well, uh, you, you, have, you have a lot of popular support, uh, but nothing happens until Google jumps in uh, or, or other large, uh, right. you know, invested players. Uh, first off, I'm shocked, shocked that money drives <laughs> politics in the United States. <laughs> um, I think that's a very interesting observation. I think it's in terms of the rise of the professionalization of politics in the United States there's a greater emphasis on having the expertise of how decisions are made and having those institutional relationships to drive that. More money means you can hire more actors. One problem with the net neutrality debates historically has been that there's free press has had one, maybe two lobbyists. Um, other NGOs don't have registered lobbyists. They do policy analysis but aren't lobbyists. So one or two lobbyists in supporting net neutrality, why AT&T has enough funds to hire a lobbyist for every member of Congress. Now, I, can't, I don't know if that's actually what takes place, but if you look at the expenditures and how much staffing costs, the fact that one telecom can hire a lobbyist for every member of Congress means you develop that much better personal relationships. And Jack Abramoff, has, has, um, the, he went to jail for, for bribery, and has come back out and discussed the process of lobbying. Simply donating money to a campaign means you're preferential enough that you start having dinner with the chief of staff or the member on a regular basis. You can afford to join their country clubs. A large uh, corporation can bring in managers from the local district that are a member of the local country clubs to, per to meet with staff and have a greater influence. So uh, money absolutely has an impact. As far as Google, it's interesting with the net neutrality debate, Google's not fully stepped into it. Um, within the 2010-2011 debates, uh, they met privacy for Verizon to propose a, their own way forward. So we're the biggest internet company and the biggest telecom in the United States proposing their own version of net neutrality rules. It's not a surprise that that's what the FCC went with. It did fail in court, and Google has not fully stepped in as an actor with net neutrality de debates now as they did in 2010 or that they did in SOPA. You do have other businesses involved, and I think without these businesses, uh, I don't think the debate takes, would have the same weight. Without Netflix being such a vocal, um, vocal player and vocal advocate in net neutrality, uh, 
and showing how it harms their business interests, I agree that their, their interests are um, weighted heavily. Yeah, just to basically, Andrew stole my question, but uh, but to sort of build but you on. You remember the name of the article. So. All I remember is oligarchy. <laughs> There's two guys from Pittsburgh. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was on the Gilligan Daily Show. Page. It was discussed on yeah, the yeah, Daily yeah. Show. Yeah. When has that happened? Yeah. <laughs> journal article discussed on the Daily Show. Um, but to just build on this a little bit, to tease out just a little bit more, because it seemed like you were problematizing this idea of bottom-up grassroots. I mean, to, to argue that we need to focus more on the institutional politics, I think that's a solid argument. I absolutely agree that we don't pay enough attention to that. But I also think we need, you might want to reconsider, because for example, the lobbying that was happening during uh, SOPA and now during net neutrality, you also could look on the other side who we're not referring to as activists mm -hmm. who are doing much of the same thing. And it, it starts, begging questions about regulatory capture and so I don't know if that changes your modeling here but I, I think it should be included in the equation somehow. So I think from my argument is that's a combination of public and institutional advocacy that often drives change. Uh, I think we can look at examples where institutional advocacy alone helps change happen. I think there's a great example in, in American democracy in which issues that are highly valuable to a small number of actors and aren't as interesting to the general public um, get passed. Uh, I mean, how many people here are familiar with mohair? Mohair is a type of wool that the United States started investing in. in <laughs> after, <laughs> World, sorry, after World War II, the US decided they needed to subsidize uh, mohair in order to have enough wool to support um, US military wear for the Siberian invasion of, of Russia. In the, in the 50s, the United States moved away from using mohair and, moved, and started using synthetics. That subsidy lasted until the late 80s or 90s, and a few years after the subsidy was moved, was put back in. So it's an issue that doesn't matter to most Americans, but is highly valuable to a small number of actors. So institutional advocacy alone takes place. Uh, what, I'm trying to problematize the idea of this assumption that the internet beats legislation, this assumption that activism, online engagement, the organizing has this massive power, and we need to actually problematize the visible to look at what are we not seeing and look beneath the surface. I think a great example is this idea of what happens with bottom-up movements and can bottom-up movements develop institutional expertise. I think the low-power FM debate is a great example of that. So the, the FCC moved in the late uh, 90s to, re, to start uh, to make decisions around what types of licenses were available and the request of the National Associated Broadcasters started banning and making uh, licenses unavailable to small FM stations, which meant that you weren't able to have community radio stations that had a small um, that had a small coverage but spoke to their needs. It supported ownership of large corporations owning, owning the media markets in multiple cities simultaneously. Over a 10-year battle, a group here in Philadelphia was one of the driving actors in pushing, that to, um, pushing changes in this issue. But the way they did that was developing institutional expertise and learning what was the process that takes place in the FCC, learning what takes place in Congress, and learning how to lobby. So bottom-up actors learning about the democratic processes and learning about the decision-making processes of institutions allow them to have the expertise to drive change. So that's one thing I'm interested in problematizing. Um, nice talk. Uh, have you looked at the software patent debate in Europe? Because part of the activists, many of the activists, uh, but many of the boring activists, are the ones who went on to, do, to continue in other debates. Mm -hmm. The problem with the software patent debate was it was driven by the, the geeks, the nerds. I mean, it was yeah. the Free Software Foundation, among other people. And it was uh, surprising that it actually was uh, that software patterns were beaten in Europe because it was really difficult to communicate from the in-group to the out-group. And this is what I find very fascinating here because you, you, what you're doing is you're saying exactly this, that, well, when Google comes in or when Jamie Oliver comes in and go, oh, wow, he made a funny skit about net neutrality. I wouldn't know you could do that, but okay. And then, and then he says, everyone go to this website. Then Google does the same thing. Everyone goes to the website. Everyone does something. The... I, when the experts are doing it, they're trying to explain the reasons why they're doing it. When these people are doing it, they're going, look, I'm blocking your internet unless you click on that button. Is there a danger that, even though I support what they're doing, is there a danger in their power? There's that, a danger in Google's power. Well, there's always a danger in Google's power, yeah. <laughs> um, that's a really interesting question. I think, it's a, I think it's an interesting question of should we be uncomfortable with large companies politicizing their users? <laughs> 
should be uncomfortable with Google using their homepage and using the traffic to share their particular interest within the public sphere? Should we be concerned if Verizon, as it came out this week, wants to support a tech news site, which will not have any discussion of NSA surveillance, which is one of the major political uh, issues in tech news right now. It has major costs to US companies. And which will not be discussing net neutrality, where um, Verizon has a major stake. I would say that the ability for companies to influence the public sphere is a concern. Habermas discusses the idea of the refutalization of the public sphere, in which private actors, through economic interests, are able to change the available information. I think that we should be cautious, we should be concerned aware large companies using economic power are able to start finding new avenues to influence information online. Another example of that would be what we're seeing in, in the so-called sharing economy. Uber is very effective at politicizing their users to contact regulatory boards and start and request that Uber be made available. I'm personally a little cautious in Uber because I don't think that it's just a tech company as they say and they're just providing services. I think that it's um, a company that's starting to develop a monopoly of a two-sided market and we should actually be starting to problematize on the concept of how we look at our transportation systems at a citywide level rather than just how does a tech company be disrupted by providing an app. There's questions about labor. There's questions about the uh, provision of transportation service. There's questions of their, of their advertising and the politicization of their users. So I would say we should be concerned about that. And we should be watching how actors are uh, innovating in that, so to speak. One question here, and then we got two back. Um, just going back again to the initial discussion about uh, political environment, political opportunity structure. Did you see variation within Europe in the ACTA organization, both in terms of the amount of people who got out in the streets, but also how <coughs> politicians react to them and ultimate success failure in terms of getting the Arab government and getting them to reconsider positions? Yeah, I think there's a few examples, one of which was... Um, Poland had the closest relationships to their to the members of, of the, to the ministers. They were actively meeting and had already developed institutional relationships, which I think were actually key for them having awareness that this was going to be, get signed and starting to raise that and, and have protests be made available. Another example I saw, uh, which I would say would be a, a caution of um, Bene and Segrebi's approach in which they create these ideal types of organization is that when you start looking at multiple dimensions and you start differentiating between the different actors and roles, you see different examples of how organization is taking place. It doesn't happen the same way. In France, protests were organized through central organizations. Anonymous, La Croix du Dinant, were very central in, in organizing protests in their cities. In Berlin, the Pirate Party was, a, was organizing, but they were more politicizing their actors to act as political entrepreneurs, which is more of a, a logic connective action. So in France, we saw a logic of collective action. And in, in um, Germany, it's more logic of connective action. Regards of how are the governments listen to them differently, the target of contention was European Parliament, once it went to European-wide. Um, so I can't say if different members of Parliament were reacting differently. Um, the conservatives in France were very pro-copyright. Um, um, the conservatives in Romania actually moved and be, to be more concerned about Parliament. And you did see some, some political shifts and differences of how national debates changes when we move to the, to the transnational within the European Parliament. Um, but as far as national government relationships is to actors, that wasn't something I, I looked into beyond Poland. And in terms of the variation that you mentioned, can you see reasons why, say, in Poland, they were having more access in that way, or why Germany was organizing around an, from a political party? And mm -hmm. I mean, it, is there something about the structure in which these actives uh, are working at the, the national level? Right. That um, in Poland, it had, it had to do because the groups were, were conscious they need to have relationships with the government, and they had that in a non-confrontational way. And that's one thing that took place. Within Germany, it wasn't that the activists had access to the government officials in the same way, but there was a political party that was strong in Germany, born out of the idea of pushing back against copyright maximalism, and around internet politics, and that was a unique case in which you had this unique st organizational structure already in place that then was activated with regards to ACTA. In terms of France, Poland, and Romania, why they're different, um, the actors I talked to explained that that was in terms of history of, of Europe. Poland is generally cautious about outside influence based on their history between, was it two, three hundred years of being beaten between Prussia, Sweden, Denmark, Russia, 
Germany. Um, Romania, again, is also more of an adversarial relationship to other European politics, while France conservatives are, are much more favorable to US trade concerns. So you do have histories of, of the national scale. So I think that exploring the national system and political context for the relationship of internet systems is a relevant area of further study and comparative study. In the back. That's me? Yeah. Oh, okay. So right after SOPA, CGCS actually had somebody from Google who said we knew this was going to be easy because the government can afford in election year to completely isolate the IT sector. You know, so in the model that you're arguing, which is really almost like a coalition model, right? Under what circumstances the public and the institutional advocacy converge and push for policy model. So this really follows from all the questions being asked right now is like, what, what are the factors and what is the kind of the role of the transnational actors of the context and really of the political opportunities? Because, you know, I'm just thinking is like what you're talking on the different country context of how the organizational follows, there seems to be very much differences in the institutional organization and the political opportunities that exist. I mean, SOPA and ACTA played out very differently in this context. So I was just wondering, as you know, if it's, this is kind of a coalition model, what would be the factors and the different roles that are, I don't know. So access is important access to, to decision makers, access to, um, to the process itself. Uh, and I think tech companies, Google had an established lobbying arm and they're building up their lobbying arm. They moved to a larger office and they started in, in hiring much more right-wing um, advisors to their lobbying team. In fact, their DC office now run by a Republican. We might think of Google as traditionally a democratic organization, but they're recognizing their lobbying might is based on being as bipartisan as possible media and democracy too, coalitioning with the, um, the Tea Party on a lot of internet policy. With SOPA, you did see uh, a collaboration between the right and the left, opposed to SOPA. For, it was an example of undue government regulation, it hurt business, it hurt free speech. A few people were actually in favor for in the end. With net neutrality, you're seeing a much more progressive and on the left pushback against it when the right has tried to make strange claims to everything from it's an ISP's First Amendment right to sell you whatever service they want to um, the internet. The, you know, the government shouldn't be in the process of regulating companies. Um, in terms of coalitions, I think it depends on the political context of where do, what is the relationship of business traditionally with decision making with governance. The United States has had a very business friendly model of governance. Some of your countries in Europe I think are a little more receptive to public input when that takes place and has less uh, regulatory capture, uh, which Victor brought up. Um, so I think that's a, a relevant thing looking at if there were to be a, a comparative study of what, why is this taking place, of understanding access to governments, uh, access, uh, who are the major players, as well as the role of the media in this. What are the processes in which these are gaining significant news stories and is that having an effect? Street protests in Europe help get news stories. An internet blackout in the United States help get news stories. John Oliver helps get news stories. And a uh, question in the back when we come to you. Yeah, I have a very quick comment on the ACTA situation because um, I think that it, building on what, uh, what Sandra and Deborah were saying, um, there were dynamics of competition within the institution, so between the European Commission and between the European Parliament that created the space that allowed activists to actually go and lobby the European Parliament. And then within the European Parliament, it was essentially a situation in which one of the one of the actors that ended up, you know, uh, bringing about the negative vote was the European Socialist Party that was really waiting to pick a fight with the EPP that they could win because they desperately needed that in, in electoral terms. So this was, you know, these are sort of driving forces that are behind, like they're that go beyond what activists are able to do. But these are the sort of the configurations and divisions of power that then allow activists to find a space in which to interject. So in this way, I would second, you know, the idea of bringing back political opportunity structures and exactly this sort of dynamic to understand that maybe there is a lot to be said about failure and success of these strategies considering what's happening within the elites. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're absolutely right. So European trade agreements in Europe were traditionally negotiated by the European Commission. When the Lisbon Treaty was passed in 2009, was ratified in, gosh, I'm thinking, I think it was 2011, it gave European Parliament the first opportunity to vote on whether or not to approve or reject a 
a trade agreement. And there's a historical tension between the Commission, which is seen by some as an unelected body of experts, and the European Parliament, which is Democrat elected members, and who actually has a decision making power. So you have some contention between some members of Parliament and the Commission. And that's why I said that uh, in the beginning that this was a unique opportunity for European democracy. And this did create the opportunity for Parliament to be the target of contention uh, for this debate. I think if the target had only been the Commission and it was pre Lisbon Treaty, it's quite possible we'd see an entirely different um, type of debate because you wouldn't be able to lobby and put pressure from an activist perspective the same way. You also had very active members within the European Parliament, and the European Greens was actually a central organizing movement, um, coalition between the Green Party, including the Pirate Party, in rising opposition. The first um, opinion written by Parliament was done by Mile Anders' daughter, who was elected at 24 from Sweden as a member of Pirate Party, uh, who wrote the opinion um, within the first committee vote on why ACTA should be rejected based on um, procedural and, and human rights concerns. So I think the political opportunity question is, is important. I think in a, the op ability to investigate a political opportunity depends on understanding the actors and the institutional process. So in, uh, in the US, um, activist groups now have a, a veto, basically, on, on any tech legislation. Um, in Europe, there are some cases where there has been new legislation created in part in response to activism. What would sort of have to happen in the US for that to happen? Are there lessons from Europe that could be applied to the U.S.? And obviously, there's the there's the our party, which you know yeah. has seats in the EU. Maybe we have Al Franken in the U.S. I don't know. That, that, that <laughs> infiltration. Uh, but even something as innocuous as an orphan rights bill doesn't make it anywhere in the U.S. Where today, actually, uh, the EU, EU orphan rights uh, legislation goes into effect. What's the relationship between orphan rights and internet? Uh, that would be, I think, a, um, a uh, an activist-led, um, non big copyright, non okay. Um, non big media piece of legislation. So I think I would do two, two things. One, I wouldn't make the assumption that activists in the United States have a, have a veto power over internet legislation. And I think that's, that's bored on the assumption that the ability to organize online, A, will be as large as the SOFA blackouts, which we saw with net neutrality was not the case, B, be as effective a second time around as the SOFA blackouts, and C, that public adequacy alone and the activism alone will drive, um, will push back against change. So I would caution about that. I think we, um, I think we will consider, we will see um, new routes, attempts of internet legislation, and we'll particularly rest. the fallout from the debates around NSA surveillance will be what is the way that the, um, what is the way that the Congress decides to legitimize um, some types of surveillance in the USA Freedom Act is a divide among activist actors. Some institutions in DC think the USA Freedom Act is a positive step forward. While otherwise, actors on a larger scale are more concerned about the fact that it condones massive um, blanket surveillance of, of non-US actors on global scale. And I, I don't think internet actors have the same power to push back against that SOPA. I think a better question would be, how do we actually push for, as you said, actually make change happen? How do we have a positive effect? I think net neutrality is an interesting example of that, which is developing the institutional expertise and relationships over a long term to have the ability to influence decision making is an essential part of that. It's hard to come out of the woodwork uh, on a short scale and propose a bill and get it passed. There were attempts to have a declaration of internet freedom. There was attempts by Dell ISA to have a bill of rights for the internet and have it crowdsourced. These are short-term campaigns. Democratic policymaking is a uh, trenches project that takes long-term effort. It can take half a decade, it can take a decade. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a new telecommunications act debated in the next half decade or so. And that would be dependent on what are the institutional and trans experts, both from internet activists and actors, but as well as the companies in DC and think tanks in DC that are able to put uh, influence into that. It's common that uh, one of the differences between Europe and the United States that I see is that, that most European politicians are more dependent on their actual voters. So if there are a lot of people are shouting at you, it's going to be make, make more of a difference. While here, not a lot of people shouting, but that's not going to get you elected or out. So that might be one of the reasons. I think the difference between uh, the U.S. political system and parliamentary politics is probably a, a valid question. I think it's, um, that would be a question of how do you compare the internet studies and understand the political context in which decision making is taking place and regulation is being developed and why, well, how does the political um, context influence that shaping? Other questions? Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, find me on Twitter, send me an email. Uh, this will be a, 
a continuing research project and interest of mine over the coming years. And the uh, concept of how we do competitive internet research and internet systems um, will be the, the topic of my dissertation that I'm working on. So I hope to talk to you next.